I'm Professor Alejandro Armelini. I'm Director of the Institute of Learning and Teaching at the University of Northampton. We focus on, uh, on providing highly inspirational teaching, enabling our, our colleagues to deliver that teaching in the most creative and transformational ways possible so that those learners can benefit the most and um, identify themselves as University of Northampton graduates. Uh, prior to joining Northampton, I worked at the universities of Leicester, Manchester and Kent, uh, where I developed a track record in, and publication record in uh, areas of learning innovation, capacity building in, across higher education institutions, learning technology and technology enhanced learning. My aspiration is to bring those uh, experiences and that research to the fore and, and uh, turn that uh, expertise and that research into practical outcomes for the benefit of our colleagues and our students at Northampton. For those of you that I've worked with before at other institutions, I'm sure you will see, you will recognize some of the lessons learned over the years, over the wonderful times that we shared at those institutions, and hopefully those lessons will be reflected uh, and taken forward today, and maybe um, taken forward again by yourselves uh, in future practices. <clears throat> Let me... Um, show you one or two uh, introductory slides uh, to expose you to some of the terms that you will see and you will hear throughout the presentation. Some of them might be quite common, quite normal, expected. Others might be different. Um, we will be talking about um, OER, Open Educational Resources. We will be talking about high value interventions, we will be talking about social enterprise, we'll be talking about synchronous and asynchronous things. <clears throat> but that's a kind of a summary of key words that we will debate, discuss, and learn about today. Today's journey, <clears throat> very much influenced by my own experience and career across institutions here and overseas. We'll kick off with some context, trends, principles. Uh, we'll move on to VLEs, virtual learning environments, and in particular, Nile. And for those of you who come from other institutions, Nile uh, is our Northampton's VLE. Uh, it's the Northampton Integrated Learning Environment, and it is Blackboard. So that's what I refer to in the second bullet point. Uh, then I'll move on to Cairo things, uh, designing for effective collaborative learning, then going open with Open Northampton, uh, beyond the open MOOCs, or something similar to MOOCs that we'll be discussing in a few minutes. <clears throat> I have to tell you a little bit about the Institute of Learning and Teaching in Higher Education. Of course, I have to, you, that's expected, and, and, and I'm very pleased to show you one or two slides about that as well, and uh, particularly the Learning and Teaching Plan that uh, is just about to get uh, approved by the different committees, um, concluding with a summary. So that's the plan for today, but I realize that in lectures of this kind, uh, one is not supposed to start talking about learning outcomes and, and things, but there is one learning outcome. Uh, at least one that I would like to uh, put to you, and that is that by the end of today, you will be dot, dot, dot. And that is inspired to try one thing. Just get one thing that you like from today and try it out, okay? In the process of trying it out, it might be that you can inspire others, colleagues, learners, and maybe beyond the institution as well. So I hope that that kind of makes sense and uh, sets the context for what's the first bit, which is actually the context. <clears throat> I've picked uh, an interesting report. It's already a couple of years old, the Online Learning Task Force, because it contains a number of very uh, significant recommendations. 
And I picked three of them, which are there. Um, one has to do with student choice and technology, and not just meeting but exceeding what students expect of institutions and of ourselves. <clears throat> the second is, is a commitment to embed online practices uh, in a strategic way. And the third is about OER. <clears throat> and if you haven't come across to, to this um, report, I strongly suggest that you take a look at it, because many of the things that were said two years ago are still very, very relevant today. But you, the UK is one aspect of it. We could move to other parts of the world. And just to give you a sample, in the US, if we, um, if we look at the body of students in higher education, regardless of mode of, mode of study, regardless of uh, type of course, nearly one third of them take at least one online course, probably many more. <clears throat> and two thirds of academic leaders in, in the US rate learning outcomes in online education as the same or superior to those in face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> uh, critically, again, nearly two thirds of HEIs consider online learning as a critical element of the long-term strategies. Uh, again, going the distance is an interesting source. That report, um, again, a couple of years old. This slide, used with permission from my esteemed colleague, Gronia Canole, blatantly plagiarized by me and adapted where appropriate. Uh, in the spirit of openness, of course. Uh, it's a very useful slide, uh, because although we could spend the rest of the, of the evening debating the extent to which these things overlap and the extent to which these things happen in the order that I will show you, um, it does give us a structure. To, to work with. We can debate whether multimedia resources started in the early 80s or before. Um, Computer-based training, that sort of thing. Um, the internet and the web made an explosion in the early to mid 90s. Uh, learning objects followed, kind of closed, non-editable particularly learning objects. Learning management, management system, LMSs or VLEs. Um, Follow. So do you, does anyone here remember WebCT? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course you do. WebCT, mid-90s. Mid uh, what a battle it was. <laughs> yes, and, and now it is Blackboard, of course. Um, mobile devices. Learning design as a discipline. Um, gaming. <coughs> Game-based learning. OERs with the MIT Open Courseware Consortium, social participatory media in the mid-2000s, uh, virtual worlds. Who's had experience in Second Life and Open Sim? Mm -hmm. Have you? Yeah. Uh, there's been, I don't know if you remember, but if you went to the relevant conferences about three, four years ago, there were tons of papers about virtual worlds. Last year, there was one. Mm -hmm. uh, e-books and, and, uh, and smart devices, smartphones and so on. And uh, not least, MOOCs, massive open online courses. So that's a useful timeline to get us thinking about what, what has been happening in the last 30 years or so. Um, a few principles that colleagues from Leicester will certainly recognize uh, the idea of generating change on the basis of low cost but high value, using stable, normalized technologies that generate positive change without costing us a fortune. Design once, deliver many times. <coughs> Versioning. Thinking smarter about our courses and their shelf life. What does shelf life mean now? Aligning assessment with learning outcomes, with methods, rapid feedback. And of course, in the, in the core to this in university is social enterprise and entrepreneurship. We need to think in every one of the courses that we teach how that is embedded in what we do. And in particular, 
in how we teach. <clears throat> this again is, is uh, an adapted version of a very useful uh, model uh, originally created by another esteemed colleague, Professor Jilly Salmon. Uh, many, of, many of you will have met Jilly when she was here for the annual learning and teaching conference uh, last year. <clears throat> um, it's a little different from what she originally put forward, but uh, I, I try to adapt this to, to our context. And I promise by the end of today's talk, you might think that the only thing I do is two by two matrices. But, uh, <laughs> but I promise you it isn't true. Um, so you have, uh, for the people at the back, you might not be able to see that what it says is missions, markets, markets, and contexts. And here is technology and pedagogy. And we're trying to map old and new, or if you like, present and new. And we start with the easy bit, which is the technologies of, of today for the students of today. And that's, that's the bit that cannot go wrong. That's the bit that cannot crash. That's the bit that, that if, that's mission critical. If it goes wrong, we're in serious trouble. VLE, Blackboard, Nile, the e-library, Microsoft Office, the network, that, those things cannot go wrong. <clears throat> then creative applications of existing tools to target new markets. So we can use, we can use what we've got to go elsewhere and attract other people and attract other students and attract other colleagues and other expertise to Northampton. <clears throat> That's it's getting a little bit harder on the right-hand side uh, because we're talking about what we've got in terms of courses, programs, uh, but how we can embrace new technological and innovation opportunities to deliver them, to work with them, and to make them better. But the, the top right is the real, the real challenge, is the new new. It's the most, risk, um, the most risky bit of the lot. And that is, what can we do with what's coming to attract, to attract those who are coming? Um, <clears throat> and that's where we need to learn a bit about not just the profile of the student of the future, uh, but what the technology can r realistically support to get them to our institutions. So if we look at that from right to left, what we've got is effectively an innovation pipeline. <coughs> and in, in terms of what the left-hand side is against the right, we could, we could argue that development is the left and research is on the right. So I find this quite interesting and quite useful to understand what we need to do and where the risks lie. So let's think about the Northampton Integrated Learning Environment. It's important to understand what it is and equally important to understand what it isn't. Do you recognize some of these logos down here? Yeah. Has anyone used Sakai? Yes, or well, one person. Um, Moodle, certainly quite a lot of people will have used Moodle, yeah. Um, Blackboard or Nile is a very, very powerful tool and it enables us to do many things. One thing that Nile is not is a content management system. There are other tools for that. And we will return to the issue of content again and again throughout today. <clears throat> A VLE or LMS, or Learning Management System. And again, this is taken from uh, a publication by Gronin Canole last year. Uh, that is what we would call the core. The bits, again, that cannot possibly go, go wrong because they are student-facing. <clears throat> These are the things that are central to, to the VLE. And around this, we could identify various other things, how the VLE integrates with other systems in the university. Interoperability, working together in a systems uh, manner uh, so that the library talks to the VLE, so that the finance, the, the finance department can, and, and the student record system can talk to the VLE. Once you, when you register at the university, where, which courses are allocated to you, that sort of thing. 
<clears throat> and yet, we find ourselves in a situation in which we, many of us tend to be obsessed with one thing, which is the content, the content, the content. And we, t we end up using the VLE as a content repository. And that has a number of advantages, but it also has a number of problems, as we will discuss. And that's a question to you. Is Nile a solution looking for a problem? Or if you want to phrase the question in a different manner, uh, what is the problem to which Nile is the solution? And a lot, a lot of colleagues, I found this again and again across the sector, launch, dive into the use of the, the VLE because of a variety of reasons, but have not really cracked the question of what is the problem I'm trying to fix here. <clears throat> so let me give you some examples of those problems. And these are real things that colleagues have told me. Um, I want to teach online, but I don't know where to start. Right? Everyone uses Nile, so I want to explore it. My limited skills, be it technical or pedagogical, uh, and the fact that I've got little time means a poor learner experience. Uh, another one is uh, I want a safe place to put my content. Uh, we need a safe environment to host our discussions. And my course is not interactive enough. And by interactive enough, we can, we can, well, they can mean a number of things that we'll explore as well. In course design terms, the problem can be articulated as, OK, you want to design and deliver effective online courses. And in doing so, you widen access, you recruit more students, you add flexibility, you save time, you promote engagement, but you, Im you have a positive impact on the experience of learners. So is Nile the solution to all of that? Um, well, someone gives you access to Nile, and surely that's your problem solved. And as you expect, I've got bad news, and it isn't solved. So I hear you cry. I can fix that. I can get training, can't I? And what has been the problem with training as far as Nile and other VLEs are concerned? The problem is that a lot of that training focuses on what you can do with, rather than what you need, rather than what you want to achieve. <clears throat> and that is highly, highly problematic. We, we find ourselves in a situation in which the tool drives the change. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be like that. It could be different. Um, it has some symptoms. This problem has a number of symptoms, One, a couple of them there. Um, if, if I send you the files, could you put them on Nile for me? How, if you are honest, those of you who work at Northampton, how many times have you heard that? <laughs> I've only been here six months. And I probably heard that about 20 times. But, but Northampton is not alone. When I was with you guys at Leicester, we used to hear that all the time in the media zoo. All the time. And let's, let's be clear, putting the content on Nile is not exactly something that requires a lot of skill. It's quite straightforward. Uh, lack of understanding, oh yeah, I see that it's a content repository. Let's set up a discussion board and see how it goes. So that's, that's a serious one. So in other words, I put my content online, therefore my, stu my students do e-learning. Yeah? Uh, and they don't. Or some of them do. Uh, but that's not really what, what, where, where best practice lies. Uh, remember the obsession with content. I put my content online, therefore my students do e-learning. To be clear, you put your content online, that's a good starting point. But the resource, that content, is not the course. The PDFs and PPTs that usually populate Niles won't teach themselves. And the reason I put that horrid 
uh, screenshot is just I grab that from a course. Right? But deliberately you can't read it. <laughs> okay? So uh, that's where we are. And then I hear you cry once more. And what are you crying? Oh, but they won't engage. And that is the result of setting up a discussion board and see what happens. That's what happens. Why is no one discussing anything? Because probably they don't have a good reason to discuss anything. And that reason doesn't have to be assessment. There could be other good reasons too. That takes me nicely to effective design and Cairo. I couldn't possibly remember what Cairo means. So Anne told you the meaning of the acronym before, which I hasten to add was created long before I joined Northampton. So uh, neither Shirley Bennett nor myself have anything to do with the creation of the acronym. But someone in the room does. Uh, and I will, I will not point uh, at her in order not to embarrass Ali. Sorry. Uh, um, so, um, but they came up with a nice Egyptian type uh, uh, name that had to do with Nile and we're, we're now working on a project called Pyramid, I think. F focuses on um, your problem. Cairo is about what you need to do, what you need to achieve, your needs, your course. You are at the heart of it, you as a course team. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, we want to capitalize on what, on what Nile can offer us mm, only so far as those features resolve pedagogical problems. It is not a case of using a blog because blogging is sexy these days, or it has been for a few years. It's a case of using a blog or a wiki or a discussion board if those things solve a problem. <clears throat> and of course, in doing, in running Kairos that way, in a structured, researched, credible manner, we build institutional capability and autonomy. And hopefully, the emails put this file on Cairo, on Nile for me, will not happen that often. <clears throat> That's a, a recent Cairo. In fact, this was about 10 days ago. Uh, we were designing for an MA in youth and community work. This is one of the activities that they were doing. Uh, and uh, this is another one, but this is in a different institution. They, in the previous slide, they were looking at course features. On this one, they are drafting a storyboard. In the previous one, they were using cards and things. In this one, they're using very low tech resources. Yes, the, 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 the higher tech is at the back. It's, it's there when, when needed, but this, is a thinking process to build the storyboard of a course. It's a very powerful way to design it. In sum, Cairo begins with a blueprint for the course, moves on to a storyboard, which is the, probably the most creative part of it, then on to prototypes, reality check, which is where a student or a colleague comes in to review uh, the work done by the course team <clears throat> and then we adjust on the basis of their feedback and create an action plan. And that is not uh, my idea or Julie Salmon's idea of how it should work, but there is quite a bit of work done on that, a number of papers, and the latest edition of Julie Salmon's e-moderating contains a whole chapter about this. Right. You familiar with this diagram? Garrison and Anderson, and then Garrison, Anderson, and Archer. Um, communities of inquiry, and I'm talking about uh, online presence. And I, I'd like to put it to you that presence on the VLE is not a bolt-on, is not an add-on to your course. It is your course. It is as critical as that. The moment we start thinking about, oh, and, 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 and by the way, I'll put a few things on Nile, we've got a problem. What we've got on Nile is the course. <clears throat> um, I said, if you remember an earlier slide, there was the word interactive in red letters. And I said I would say one or two things about that. And that is, <clears throat> 
this. We have a number of different types of interactions, very meticulously uh, studied in Brenda's PhD work. Learner content, learner teacher, learner learner. And we've got the performance of colleagues, of teachers, during the delivery of the course, which we bluntly <laughs> categorize as poor or good. And there are various ways of crossing uh, there, but essentially, if we're talking about interaction, a lot of us immediately think of learner content. Quizzes, read, answer, question, check, and so on. Well, that's interaction with content. There are other types, many other types of interaction in addition to these three. So let's not just think about learner content interaction when we think interactive. Let's think learner teacher, let's think learner learner, let's think activities. Let, this is a real activity produced two weeks ago uh, by the Study Stills for Academic Success course team. And this is now running, this is taken from a live course. <clears throat> that encourages interactions in addition to learner content, it encourages interactions of the other types as well. We can be um, innovative in a number of ways, also with assessment and feedback. And Nile has a number of tools there as well. As you know, uh, this is, for example, the audio feature of, of um, Turnitin that colleagues are starting to use more and more. So, what are our targets for this? Where are we going with all this? Without boring you with the detail, three levels, foundation, intermediate, advanced, but mo most importantly, delivery, participation, collaboration. And we would like, and we are working towards, the fact that all blended courses, all courses with significant online elements should at least be here and all online, purely online, distance courses should be there at the bottom. Not easy, but very desirable. <clears throat> A good way to tackle this is via other interventions separate from Cairo, one of which is moderating online groups, and we've, we've done a number of them, about five of them, if I'm right, at Northampton already, all of them with very, very good attendance, in some cases with waiting lists. Uh, and one, one, of the, one of the schools that's been heading up on this or leading on this is the School of Health. And uh, a lot of colleagues from that school and from all the other schools at this point have engaged with this, and we are running many more. <clears throat> um, I said before that the only thing I know how to do well is two by two matrices. This is another one. Uh, just to challenge you a bit. You are designing a course, and then you are delivering the course, okay? The least desirable quadrant is clearly that one, isn't it? Badly designed and badly delivered. The most desirable quadrant is that one, isn't it? Well designed and well delivered. So let's get those two out of the way, okay? What about the other two? Top left means badly designed, but fortunately a good teacher grabbed it and did something really good with it, and that's recovery. And the reverse is here. A well-designed course that falls into the hands of somebody who doesn't do very well with it, and that's what a waste, okay? So, <clears throat> we could encounter a number of situations. Our delight or obsession with content often takes us to look for content in a variety of repositories, of locations, which takes us to the Open Northampton project. The Open Northampton project has a single aim which is to put us on the map of open educational resources and open educational practices within 24 months. <clears throat> Northampton took part in earlier versions, earlier iterations and stages of the OER program, of the UK OER.
program. Uh, the Tiger project was an example of that. It achieved a lot, did very well in the School of Health with a particular focus on interprofessional education. That's a tiny, tiny thing. Very good, but very small. We need, we need more than that. And that's what Open Northampton is setting out to do. Um, don't want to bore you with this, but this is a definition of open educational resources, um, re no, redrafted last year by UNESCO. Um, and <coughs> the locations where we look for these things, where we find good ones, where we can be reassured that they have been quality checked and peer reviewed are, well, these are some of those repositories. Joram, OER Commons, which is a, an aggregator, uh, the Open Course, where MIT, uh, Open Learn, of course, and iTunes U. And I'm sure many of you are using them already, or are using some of them already, to add value, to embellish, to add further resources to existing courses, or indeed to design new courses. And um, a good example from, from my previous experience at Leicester, just before I left, is that we had a target of 75% of reusable content in the new masters that we were designing at the time, which is, which is a pretty, pretty big ask. The, the remaining 25% is what provides the flavor, the context, the personalization, the Leicesterization in that case, or the Northamptonization North in ours. That is what makes it different. A question is usually asked at that point is, why would someone pay for that if the, if the stuff is somewhere else? And the answer is, can you, can anyone afford not to? Can you afford to ignore the great content that's out there in the design of your own storyboard, in the design of your own course? We cannot afford to do that. We need to take that on board, and we need to make all of that content, all of those resources from repositories, such that the Northampton student gets the best out of all of them with the Northampton flavor, context, and experience. <clears throat> a few other repositories here. Uh, you might, you might uh, know all of these, but uh, just, to, just to mention a few. Uh, Merlot is a very good one to, uh, to highlight. Uh, certainly the mother of them all, the open course were there. A um, few examples. This is from Joram. A uh, few animations that I took. I took a sample for, uh, that are relevant to different schools here. This is, this, is, um, this is anatomy, and this one is, this is about fine art. Uh, this was actually taken from Merlot. This is business. Uh, Maslow, you probably, the, the, the Maslow hierarchy of needs is one of, the, one of those diagrams that you have seen 200 versions of, and you'll have 2,000 more in those repositories, and a lot of research around it. And all of that is free. All of that is licensed for reuse. Another one, another two by two. <clears throat> How do we use open resources as they come or repurposed? During delivery or during design? If you're teaching, you're in the middle of teaching a course here and you discover a gap, you discover a hole in what you're teaching, you go to a repository, you can, you, chances are you might find something quite useful to fill that gap. And that's what that box is. The other two, uh, during design, you can plan it. During delivery, you can repurpose something and plug it in. And the strategic enhancement at the top. This diagram is the, the core of an article that Ming and I, Ming is there, uh, have published and is coming out uh, in a couple of months in open learning. <clears throat> when we talk about OER, regardless of our views on, on, this, on this chap here, uh, OER passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed, then it is violently opposed, and then it is accepted as being self-evident. Now, of course, we might debate the extent to which each of those things applies to OER. But quite frankly, my experience is that uh, there is a lot of resistance.
from colleagues across the uh, disciplines. Uh, and you reach a tipping point where they begin to say, well, actually, there's quite a lot in it for me. I can get a lot out of this, not just by using, and this is the key, but by contributing. We will not be on the map, remember the, the aim of Open Northampton, by using the resources of others and nothing else. We will be on the map by inviting others to use our resources. And that is where we need to get to. We need to get to a position where the good stuff that happens in this place is shared and is used by others, not just in this country, but around the world. <clears throat> Once you've got a critical mass of these things, you might be closer to having something like this. You might be in a position of considering a massive open online course. And I wish I had another hour or two to discuss with you the ins and outs of MOOCs. But essentially, MOOCs are all of that and free. And um, a lot of the debate at the moment is about business models and how, how these things work and what's in it for each of the providers. Let me show you a few screenshots here, and I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this. This is from edX, which is Harvard and MITx. Uh, they follow the X MOOC model, uh, as opposed to the C MOOC model, which is the, the, the connectivist one. This is, this is edX, and the subject here <clears throat> is energy. This is crit clinical, clinical problem solving. Uh, this is not taken from edX, it's taken from Coursera, um, yeah, which is actually our dot .com. We could take examples from Audacity as well. This is the one I'm doing at the moment. Is anyone doing this? You are? Good. Are you? Good. There's a couple of... Th you're far, all right, very good. <laughs> the thing is that these things, these MOOCs attract many, many, many people. The ones I showed you earlier attract students in the tens of thousands. Some of them attract up to 200,000. This one, there's only 1,000 of us, as far as I know. Belinda, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. Um, but that's, that's, going with, uh, that's being run by the Association of Learning Technology. And it is, it is a... It is a fairly relaxed environment to study. A more structured, business-minded, but very carefully planned uh, initiative in the UK is FutureLearn. And if you haven't seen, if I explore that website, I do invite you to, to do so. Led by Martin Bean at the OU, FutureLearn might be uh, a UK version of what I showed you earlier. <clears throat> Why is all this relevant to Northampton? Well, perhaps we could consider a SOOC, <laughs> uh, which is a small open online course. And I kicked, kicked off some discussions with uh, Chris Powers' team in the library uh, because of the quality of the study skills for academic success course that, that they have, that we chiroed recently. Could that be the seed to generate a souk? Maybe initially to, for a few hundred people uh, and then going beyond. We're in discussions about that and uh, I'm sure uh, colleagues will, would like to, to give us the, the views and opinions on this. I do have to tell you a bit about, oh sorry, and beautiful, small and beautiful. <laughs> I had forgotten that bit. Um, I have to tell you a bit about the Institute. <clears throat> uh, there is, a, there is a, 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 a website up and running now with a preliminary content there. Um, but uh, that's what the Institute is. That's our mission. And that's what we do. We are focusing on transformational 
experiences for our Northampton students. We want to achieve those through inspirational teaching. We want to teach well. We want to teach well across all levels, disciplines, schools, <clears throat> within the campus, beyond the campus. We want to teach well in practice, in practice-based learning, in work-based learning, in schools, as in primary schools, as well as within, within our campus. <clears throat> Areas of work, with special thanks to Shirley for um, enabling me to map them nicely to the, um, the areas of, uh, of work of the United Kingdom Professional Standards Framework. That, that maps the areas of activity of the Institute. And each of the things that I've been telling you about will um, directly map onto one or more of these. And, um, and we have a plan. And the plan is developing, and the plan is moving forward. <clears throat> it has three key strands which are aligned with the university's strategic plan, which is called Raising the Bar. Uh, intellectual capital, student experience, and enhancement and innovation in learning and teaching. And although I will not bore you with all of that, uh, you can see the three strands there and the various components of it, each of those is underpinned by a separate document, of course, which identifies actions and targets. <clears throat> However, three things to highlight here. Our commitment to those three things. Expanding, improving, enhancing online and blended provision. Working closely with the Higher Education Academy and other bodies in the sector for an enhanced CPD accreditation, <clears throat> and a commitment to openness. And of course, we have a plan for that. If we go back to this, you'll see in the top left, there is a big chunk about the CPD framework. Well, that's that CPD framework expanded. And again, I will not go into the detail, not least because Shirley will fall asleep within the next five minutes, but if you look, Qualifications here, that's the PGCTHE, turning soon into a master's and hopefully an EdD in, 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 in due course, and the different levels of fellowship across the top here. Each of those boxes will be populated with practical, practical interventions, particularly at this end, and more master's type level seven interventions here to deliver both a higher number of colleagues across the university with fellowships and senior fellowships, as well as more colleagues across the university with the PG Cert and hopefully other qualifications such as a master's. <clears throat> I am running out of time quite seriously, so a few things you must not escape without knowing today. So a few takeaways, okay? So don't leave the room without knowing this. 21st century learning, open, mobile, connected, scalable. We must not forget those. <clears throat> New forms of collaboration, communication, and uh, flexibility as the norm. But I particularly want you to remember the top one. We need to shift to appropriate blends. What is an appropriate blend in each context, in each discipline, across different levels? <clears throat> Shift to openness. Do not worry too much about who will use your material. Let them use it. Mobile. The figures that I don't have time to explore today with you, the figures indicate an amazing number of accesses from mobile devices to all our services, not just Nile. Mobile learning uh, is to, here to stay and, and, and will be here to stay for a long time. <clears throat> Effective course design is team-based. Cairo, we focus on different types of interaction, not just learner content. Therefore, we are not obsessed 
and we shouldn't be obsessed with content. Low cost and high value. We do require digital literacy skills, of course. And the controversial must be innovative, participative, and fun. And some people that I discuss Kairos with look at me in a bit of disbelief when I tell them it's actually quite, quite a lot of fun. Simon, you were there at one. Uh, was it fun? Thank you. Good. Um, Nile, not, not a barrier, but an enabler. <clears throat> Should meet your needs and those of your course, your learners, your team. Not driven by the technology. You can do this with Nile. Well, what do you want to do, really? Let's see how Nile can help you get there. It's not a content dump, although uploading content is a good start. Not an add-on to your course. It is your course. OERs. Content is not king. We can't afford to ignore them. As users, OERs to enhance what we do. As contributors, don't agonize over the family silver. Share it. Best, the best thing you can hear from a community of peers is that they've used your stuff and they loved it. Share it. MOOCs or SOOCs. Register on one. Remember the learning outcome? Try one thing. If you haven't done it, go to edX, go, some, go anywhere, look for a MOOC, register on one, see what it's like. Our vice, our vice chancellor did one. So he can tell you the, 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 his experiences of this. Um, we have people in the room who are doing MOOCs. Do register on one. Critically, contribute to one. Find the right networks to see whether you can be a MOOC developer with a team of people from around the world. And put yourself and the university on the global MOOC map, not just the global OER an OEP map. This is a good time to be around, a good time to have an impact on things at Northampton and beyond. Our chance to shape it. Thank you. quite a few things distinguish our graduates and our colleagues from the graduates and colleagues from other institutions. Uh, and I've referred to a few of them in, in my previous interventions. Um, however, the quality of learning and teaching is the one that concerns me the most. I do want to get our university to be an absolute flagship of high, the highest quality learning and teaching across the sector and I trust my colleagues across the university will work with me to that aim.